Jupiter losing its spot, Starhopper gets a new engine, Falcon 9 to launch multiple landers to the moon's surface by 2020 and a Mars sample return mission from ASA. First of all, I would like to start this episode with a huge thank you. My first week on YouTube is over and I got my first 20 subscribers. You rock. That's right, I'm a baby on YouTube. Even though there have been so many of you watching my first steps into this new adventure, I'm overwhelmed. So thank you for watching and subscribing. I want to make this my day job and it's the only thing I am focusing my time on right now. I'll keep working on the episodes and you'll keep subbing. Thanks again for tuning in on What About It. Now, as always, let's dive right into today's exciting topics. Jupiter is losing its great red spot, but what about it? Jupiter, the giant in our solar system. The fifth planet in our solar system is a giant and it deserves the title. It has a mass of a thousandth of our sun. Doesn't sound like much, right? Let me put it into another perspective for you then. That's two and a half times the mass of all other planets in the solar system combined. Better? Most people though know it by something else. It's eye staring into the void that is space. Jupiter has a huge red spot and by huge I mean gigantic. This big red spot has been under observation for roughly 500 years now. First sighted by Robert Hooke. What a strange looking guy. He described a faint spot on the planet in May 1664. From there on, astronomers were hooked. What could it be and why is it there? Now we know, it's a storm and let me tell you, that thing is huge. Even its sound waves are so strong, they crash in the upper atmosphere like waves on a beach, heating up the gases above the storm by several hundred degrees Kelvin. Cassini, for example, described it as a permanent spot and observed it from 1665 to 1713. Then the spot was gone. No sighting was described until the late 1800s. Astronomers believe that the spot that we're seeing today might be a different one from the one that Hooke observed. The eyes though. At the start of 2004, it had a longitudinal extent of 40,000 kilometers, that's 25,000 miles. There's one thing in particular though that keeps astronomers busy. It's been shrinking for the past couple of decades. This shrinking seems to be speeding up even further. On May 19th, Anthony Wesley, a hobby astronomer from Queensland, Australia, made an incredible picture with his backyard telescope. In this picture, you can clearly see something called blade form. Do you see that long dark bow in the northern region of the spot? That's a part of the storm that's been flaking off and it's a huge part. So far, it's unclear why the storm is showing this behavior. What's clear though is that if it keeps doing it, the red spot that we're calling a part of Jupiter will be gone rather sooner than later. Only time will tell though. I'll keep you updated if there's any further development. Starhopper gets an engine. On June 1st, Raptor met Hopper. It's not the first time they met, but this time it's to make it hop. I'll just talk over these pictures, you'll have to see them in full size. By the way, huge thanks go out to Mary aka Boca Chica Girl. Your work is appreciated by so many. As you can see, preparations are fully underway for the first untethered tests. The latest SN4 version of Raptor has arrived from McGregor, Texas. It has been attached and is awaiting final installation and checks. With a second construction site in Florida recently revealed, it's very clear that folks at SpaceX want to make this happen sooner than later. SN4 is not the final version of Raptor, so expect that to change in the future again. SpaceX seems to never stand still right now. As soon as there is more to report on, I'll let you know. SpaceX Falcon 9 will launch multiple private moon landers in 2020. On Friday, May 31st, NASA held a live stream on Facebook, which I watched for you. Now isn't that nice of me? That live stream was another reveal by NASA. Apparently these guys don't stand still either. But what about it? NASA revealed the three private companies to send lunar landers to the surface by 2020. These landers are part of NASA's early steps in their recently announced and very ambitious Artemis program to bring back humans to the moon in 2024 and even more importantly to establish a sustainable long-term presence on it by 2028. The three companies chosen for this first step are the Pittsburgh-based company Astrobotics. 
Their five engine lander, known by the name of Peregrine, will be able to land a maximum of 265 kilograms of payload on the moon's surface. A kilo comes in at 1.2 million dollars. Anyone want to sponsor a kilo or two for me, by the way? The first mission, though, will have far less payload on board. Safety first. Their deal with NASA? Worth 79.5 million dollars. Good job. Company number two, Intuitive Machines. This Houston-based company has been given 77 million dollars by NASA to deliver up to five different payloads to the moon's surface next year. Their target is a huge plane called Oceanus Porcelarum. That should be an easy target if you can talk about easy at all when sending payloads to the lunar surface. Number three is Orbit Beyond. They got the lion's share. With 97 million dollars awarded by NASA, they have the most ambitious goal of all three of them. Their target? Mare Imbrium. Does it ring a bell? We've been there before. On July 31st, 1971, Apollo 15 already paid Mare Imbrium a visit. Orbit Beyond is planning to deliver up to four payloads to the infamous lava plane on the surface of the moon. They will use their Z-01 lander to accomplish the mission. Part of the Orbit Beyond team is the India-based subcontractor Indus. They were already part of the Google Lunar X Prize intended to spur off-Earth economy which ended in 2018 without a winner. Indus didn't stop there though and is now part of the Artemis mission. As of making the video their website was down and under construction so I'll put a link into the description. So what about it? What's the big news for SpaceX? It's pretty simple. SpaceX was able to secure two of the three teams for its launch system. They will use Falcon 9 rockets. That's not only multiple launches for the contract books of 2020, it also means that it's their first wave of contracts to the moon. SpaceX will be part of Moon's history from here on. And that even without Starship flying. SpaceX next Falcon Heavy hits milestone as final parts arrive in Florida. Pad 39A is getting crowded. SpaceX transportation department is very busy lately. Late last week, all major parts of the Falcon Heavy, an interstage, three boosters and the payload fairing arrived at the pad and are undergoing assembly right now. We're on track for the next Falcon Heavy launch. This rocket always gets me excited the most. It's still incredible to see all three boosters land again. It definitely has something magical to it. The major goal of this launch will be to fulfill the Air Force's STP-2 mission. It will especially put the upper stage under a lot of stress. It will have to last several hours and require four different ignitions and shutoffs of the Merlin vacuum engine. If SpaceX succeeds, this would mean a USAF Falcon Heavy certification. On top of that, it would mean that Falcon's upper stage is capable of complex multi-ignition flight patterns. These, for example, are also needed for lunar insurgents. That's a product NASA would definitely want to use as well. Yet again, SpaceX's products would become a bit more versatile. Also, as mentioned in an earlier episode, this would be the Air Force's first use of a flight-proven rocket. It will help them to develop a certification for future missions and is the first time the Department of Defense is seriously looking into the used rocket market. Sample return mission to Mars by ESA. Mars has always been a magnet for surface missions from Earth. We've sent all sorts of probes to a red neighbor's surface, 15 to be precise. The first to show that it can be a very difficult task was the Soviet Mars 2 mission. The lander crashed into the Martian surface on November 27th of 1971. Others, like the infamous twin rover Spirit and Opportunity, showed us how much science can be done and how important it is to study our neighbor. One thing is still missing though. We achieved it with the Apollo program on the moon, but it still has to be done on the Martian surface. We've not laid hands on a return sample yet. ESA wants to change that. In a collective effort with NASA, they are trying to get that first little rock from the red planet back to the surface of Earth. But what about it? Why would that be so important? Can't we just do the research on the Martian surface? There are two major problems with doing the science on the red planet's surface. Every payload sent down to the planet's surface has tight weight limits at the moment. Every pound of equipment sent down through the planet's atmosphere makes the mission more expensive and more difficult. Especially research equipment can be pretty heavy and bulky. On Earth though, samples could be studied thoroughly with the best equipment available. Every little grain can be picked apart and thoroughly searched for knowledge we might not even expect to be there yet. 
Secondly, a robot is far less capable of doing research than its human counterpart. It sometimes takes the rover teams days or even weeks to just plan a simple robotic arm movement for one drilling. Something that can be achieved by a human in minutes. So far more research can be done in far less time. But what about it? Why haven't we brought back a rock by now? Welcome to the difficult part. It takes a huge amount of planning and work to just get a little bit of redness back through the dark void of interplanetary space to our home base. Multiple launches are needed, several missions and loads of funding. In the latest ESA proposal, for example, first a rover would be shot towards Mars. It would land on the surface, drive around and prepare and deposit samples on the ground. A second mission then sends another smaller delivery rover down to the planet's surface together with an ascent vehicle. That small rover then drives to the sample locations, picks them up and returns them to the ascent and return vehicle, which then takes them back into orbit. Meanwhile, another rocket shoots a satellite into Mars orbit for sample pickup. The return vehicle then returns the samples to the satellite, which in return sends the samples back to Earth. See what I mean? Even though it sounds like a simple task at first, with traditional approaches that simple task soon turns into a huge undertaking with loads of opportunities to fail at any point. Maybe we should just wait for SpaceX to get Starship ready. In theory, that sounds like a much more feasible solution. Starship delivers cargo to the surface of Mars in 2024 and in the return trip they take some samples, right? So let's hope Hopper hops and Starship gets done soon. It would save loads of money and time. Go SpaceX! So this again wraps up today's episode of What About It? Share your thoughts with us. Will Falcon 9 deliver the payloads to the moon? And is it actually the right approach to return to its surface? Will Falcon Heavy's upper stage rock? And will we see a rock returned by Acer first or by SpaceX? Thank you for watching this episode of What About It? If you liked what you saw, don't forget to press the like button and subscribe to the channel because that helps a lot. Also, hit me up on my Patreon page to give me additional help in creating more and better content because that's what I like to do the most, to give you the latest and greatest in space and science. I hope to see you on the next episode. Until then, have a great time.